tiny hamlet in Belgium, where gentle hills roll to the horizon. Down in one of the valleys, if you listen, you can hear it, this tranquil little brook. Isolated at the edge of a forest, it is one of the most beautiful and peaceful places in all of Europe. At least it is today. But in December 1943, World War II raged in the skies above. A young Cleveland pilot, Wilton Erickson, would not live to see Christmas. Shot out of the sky, he would be lost for more than 50 years. Here you see his bullet hole. But now, the grandsons of men who served under Hitler believe they found the wreckage of Wilton's plane. They want to honor him by returning Wilton to his family for burial in Cleveland. Near that little brook, they dig, as Wilton's brothers watch. But after all this time, is this the right spot? Tonight, the life and death of Wilton Erickson and the extraordinary effort, half a century later, to answer his family's prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us as we are now going to take our brother home. News Channel 5 presents our Five on Your Side special report. Final mission, the Wilton Erickson story. Good evening. I'm Bill Scheel in Lotzerat, Belgium, just outside of Germany. In fact, just across those hills over there is Germany. In 1943, a young pilot from Cleveland was flying back from there, but he never made it as far as I am standing. Tonight, we tell his story, and as you'll see, a whole lot more. It begins with the birth of the young man whose death has brought us all here. The year was 1918. The pictures were still silent. In the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, just outside Paris, Germany signed a treaty of surrender. It ended what was then called the War to End All Wars, World War I. That same year in Cleveland, Wilton Erickson was born to Esther and Gus Erickson, the first of three sons. The family lived in East Cleveland, on Hampshire Road in Cleveland Heights, and in Kenton, about 60 miles to the south. Wilton was closest in age to Wally, on top here, who was two years younger. Wally is today 77. We lived on a farm a lot of the time. We'd uh go into the haymow and jump out of that. And a lot of crazy things that kids do, but he was, he was a good brother. Wilton's baby brother, Wayne, is today 66. Did you look up to him? Oh yeah, I looked up to both my brothers, yeah. As the oldest, Wilton was the family peacemaker. Quiet, sincere, Wilton loved flying even as a boy. At Cleveland Heights High School, he wrote a book report on Germany's World War I flying ace, the Red Knight, better known as the Red Baron. Just after high school, history would, for the first time, change Wilton's life. The first term of duty elected President Franklin Eleanor Roosevelt saw the battle against unemployment and poverty renewed with fresh vigor. The Depression led Wilton to join the CCC camp, one of President Roosevelt's jobs programs for young people. A short time later, history changed his life again. America entered World War II, and Wilton joined the service simply because it was the right thing to do. He became, what else, a pilot. His bravery is beyond question, but like many other young men, his letters home during training reveal he may have had more courage than he did skill. I had been having trouble with landings, but I finally got them straightened. A month before he died, Wilton wrote his parents with the best news of his life. We decided to be married before I leave for overseas. He and Dorothy Stang from Lorraine became newlyweds. But on page two of that same joyous letter, Wilton sounds worried about his flying. I don't seem to be able to hit the broad side of a barn door. Take it from your son. I am no hot rock when it comes to flying. In late 1943, the air war over Europe was brutal. Pilots were blown out of the sky or hunted down to the ground. Past the smoke, this is Wilton in the cockpit of his P-38, the morning of December 1st, 1943, about to take off from England on his first and last combat flight. His squadron's mission, escort bombers on a raid of a ball bearings plant in Solingen, Germany. This is U.S. Army film from that day, that actual bombing run. It shows only American planes attacking the Nazis. 
Wilton squadron zeroed in on Solitude without coming under fire and turned to head home. Wilton didn't make it very far, crashing 100 miles southwest of Solingen, just across the border in Lazarat, Belgium. He was brave and he was young and inexperienced. In written reports filed later, Wilton's squadron mates described his flying that day as very erratic. One writes he was even a danger to American pilots. The squadron engaged the enemy and then circled twice to reform to get back in formation. Wilton got lost both times. The second time, no one found him. Alone in the sky, scared on his first mission, Wilton Erickson sought out other friendly planes, and he found some. American bombers also headed back to England. That may have killed him. You see, by himself, Erickson posed no threat, and the Nazis weren't likely to waste fuel chasing him. But the roar of the bombers brought the Nazis into the sky, and Wilton Erickson, a rookie pilot, was an easy target. This older man, Matthias Gonin, was 15 that snowy December day when he saw what happened. Uh, he heard the dogfight, and then he heard the crash and the exploding ammunition. That was enough for him to come to the crash site. The translator is Manfred Klein, the young German who is leading the excavation. He spent more than a year researching archives, talking to local villagers to find this site. It is his passion. Manfred has found 15 sites and five pilots. German, American, or British, he doesn't care. They give her lives for nothing. Most people think about that. But I think they gave her life also for freedom, for freedom and peace we live in. And so Wilton's two brothers, who grew apart over the years, come together at Manfred's home to work with the young Germans whose grandfathers served in Hitler's army. At dinner that night, the talk is of peace and honor and Wilton. I know his, his face and the whole digging, the whole time when we dig there, I've got his, his face on my eyes. But when they start, what will they find? Still to come, the dig for Wilton Erickson's plane just down this hill. After all this time, would they find anything? The Ericsson's having traveled the long road here, the dig is about to begin. But now they face a bittersweet dilemma. They want to be here, but they are a little bit afraid of what they might see. Dawn, the first morning of the dig. As the work begins to prepare the site, the Ericsson brothers are already thinking ahead. And Wally's a little worried. You want to see that it's really there, but you don't want to look at it. I don't believe. I, I have no idea what it will be when it happens. Wayne is worried too. One reason I was so reluctant to to come down here, I expected to see a cockpit here with my brother sitting in it. His brothers have kept Wilton's memory with them for more than 50 years. They have traveled to Europe to where young Germans believe they found Wilton's crash site. After a jeep brings them the last mile down the hill, the first thing the Ericsons do, led by Wayne's wife Carol, is to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with us as we are now going to take our brother home. We are going to lift him up to, into the light and we are going to take him home with us. If what's dug up here is indeed Wilton's plane, no American pilot saw him crash. And after the war, the Army searched for him, but 20 miles away from where they are now digging. Within hours, they begin to pull up pieces of a plane. It is a P-38, the type that Wilton flew. And after all these years, the family has a chance to question witnesses to this crash. Matthias Gonan is one of them. Firing, fire and explosion were yeah, over. No, no fire, no fire. Yeah. Nothing. And then they found some parts of the pallet. Mm -hmm. They saw the hair. Nicolas Tumas also tells the Ericsons what he saw. After the last uh, very long burst, um, the screaming of this aircraft here uh, became louder and louder, and uh, you could hear that the plane is going down. Mm -hmm. 
Right after the plane crashed that day, several local villagers came racing down the hill. They found a few of Wilton's remains and buried them in a nearby cemetery. But even that peace was temporary. You see, less than a year later, this entire region was the center of the Battle of the Bulge. And one of the casualties of that battle was that cemetery. Mm. And he means that nobody found here other parts. So he think he's very sure that the, the rest of the pilot is still there. You've met the translator Manfred Klein, the young German leading the expedition. He has focused on finding this plane for more than a year. And now his metal detector proves him right. He has found one of the engines. The big part is there. As the digging goes on, Wally wants to help. Oh, we get to choose our, our shovels here or what? But a leg injury slows him. After watching less than an hour, though, Wayne can wait no longer. He will dig for his brother. Well, I'm going to hurry to get it done. I want to see what's going on here. And I'd like to participate in this, of course. Almost as soon as the earth is turned from the soil, 53 okay. years later, rises the smell of gasoline. Smell of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From different worlds, these different people all dig for Wilton. The Germans, the brother, okay. even Matthias Gomez, the witness. And then over the hill comes the cavalry, the American army, has come to help. David Roth, the head of mortuary affairs for the U.S. Army in Europe, along with a forensic team from Hawaii, has arrived. And they've brought with them American soldiers who will sift through the dirt to see if they find any bones. The young Americans quickly warm to and joke with the earth. Every now and then we may come across a precious mineral because all those go in the pockets and we just grin a lot. <laughs> After all the digging on the first day, they find only pieces of the plane. The family still doesn't know if there is even anything left of a pilot here. But as the sun rises on the second day, there is news. Deep in this hole, they have found human flesh. Today, you give Wilton back to his family. That's, that is what I have to do. So if it's possible for me to do that, I think that's the right thing. An hour later, not knowing what has happened, the Ericsons arrive. Their mood is upbeat. It's Wally's birthday. So, 85. I'm 77. 77. Well, yeah. happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Carol shows David a picture of Wilton. He would have been 80 this same week. Very good looking yeah. young man. Mm -hmm. The wind blows, and in a kind, compassionate tone, David Roth delivers the official be, uh, news. Looking through history, we, at uh, some point, you know, we had a purpose when we came on here, and that was to uh, hopefully uh, recover some remains. And uh, this morning, uh, we've done that. Oh, we have you? Yes. And, the uh, family's somber, quiet. They wanted to hear this, and then again, they didn't. When they told you this morning that they had found remains of the pilot, yeah. what went through you? Well, I think this is part of the funeral. It's written in reverse, but it's part of the funeral for me. And I think it's going to psychologically settle things for both of us. For both Wayne and Wally, whose birthday gift is just being here. It's finally ended and we know what happened. Hey, is there some peace in that? Yes, I think so. Still to come, it is the grandson of a man who served in the German army who has helped find Wilton Erickson. So why does he do it? It is an extraordinary story and it's next. The young man in the German reserves who is leading this expedition on his own time you've met. His name is Manfred Klein. Manfred is 25, the same age Wilton Erickson was when he was shot out of this sky. 
Manfred says after he got Wilton's picture, he'd go to the crash site alone and sit and think of the man. It is here that we spoke to Klein about why he does what he does for free. The mankind should know his story. She must realize that the war is not the right way to solve problems. Um, I think this is a good story, the story of his, his lifetime to tell the men, the guys in the world about peace in the war. You spent a year of your life getting to this day. And this morning, you have found remains. What is that like for you? On the one side, I can say, oh, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm right. I found perhaps the right crash site. OK, I'm a good guy. On the other side, I think, he's leave now. He's leaving all this wonderful place. But because of Manfred, Wilton Erickson will leave to go home to his family. Everyone working here, people from all over the world, seem to be paying respect to Wilton for his sacrifice. Like Manfred, Peter Drespa, who does most of the digging, is also a member of the German Army Reserves. Peter often wonders if someday he could be sent to Bosnia and wind up like Wilton, dead and lost. If something happened, happened like that, so I hope that some guys coming later, maybe, like us, and looking for me. Gunter Ray, once a young pilot in the German Luftwaffe, comes to honor a fallen American. That is man gegen man. It was man against man. Scary. Maybe I'm More than one time. Do pilots from different sides respect each other? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there are the people doing the work to identify if this is Second Lieutenant Wilton Erickson. I just want to show you what we've been finding here. We have uh, a Second Lieutenant rank insignia. Mm -hmm. Rick Harrington is the U.S. forensic anthropologist. It's his job to say scientifically if the remains found here belong to Wilton. As long as I know that there's someone out there who cares, that's, that's one of the things that, that means the most. So you hope for these brothers you met today that you will be able to give them an answer? Oh, yes. If the pilot cannot be identified any other way from what is found here, then DNA testing will be done. How? There is a type of DNA that all of us get only from our mothers. So bones found here will be taken to Hawaii, the DNA extracted, and then one of Wilton's brothers will give a blood sample. Then the two will be compared. The DNA technology is getting better and better so that we can take small pieces and identify people that way. Rick Harrington has to take his time scientifically, but we can tell you the remains found here belong to Wilton Erickson. How can we be so sure? In the mud, they found this bracelet bearing Wilton's name, a gift from Dorothy on Wilton's 25th and last birthday. It's the end of the story. <laughs> Sorry that we've wondered about for 53 years. Well, almost the end. Remember, Wayne and Wally had grown apart over the years until they came together at the site of their older brother's death. Wally's wife, Jean, sees it. They feel closer here. And it, it's, uh, I just think that they, they want to be involved. They want to know what's going on. Is this good for you and your brother to sort of be brought together? Like yeah, we're kind of friendly. <laughs> Is Wilton being the intermediary yeah. even again? Yeah, yeah, in a way, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's true. There seems to be a lot of irony springing up in this. Yes, there are, and none bigger than the progress two peoples can make over 50 years. You remember, we had two generations of the world in former times they killed each other and now we work together. I told you about peace on us. This is the first step. Back with a final thought in a moment. Final mission. The Wilton Erickson story continues. Once again from Europe, here is Bill Shield. One final note tonight, from Vietnam, the United States still has about 2,000 soldiers listed as missing in action. 
from Korea, about 8,000, and from the Second World War, about 78,000. Many of them lost on ships at sea. Wars, thankfully, end. But as you've seen tonight, our duty to find and honor those who died for us lives on. That's our report for tonight. I'm Bill Scheele in Belgium. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you.